What could be more uplifting and gratifying to the human soul than someone who captivates us, paves the way for us in the faith, and summons us to follow? In St. Catherine of Siena, we have such a person who in her mere 33 years on earth soars to the heights of holiness and leaves a legacy that is a treasure of the church. A mystic activist, reformer, contemplative, and doctor of the church, St. Catherine of Siena is one of the most prominent and influential figures in Christian history. On March 25th, 1347, the Feast of the Annunciation, Catherine, the youngest of 25 children, was born to Giacomo and Lapa Benicasa. Giacomo was a prosperous bull dyer, and the family lived in a comfortable, spacious home. They were a pious and devout Catholic family. Catherine never received any formal schooling, scripture reading, the preaching of the local Dominicans, and hearing about the heroic lives of the saints constituted her education. At the age of six, she had her first mystical vision. As a result of this experience, at the age of seven, she vowed to give her whole life to God, including her virginity. When Catherine turned 12, which was the customary age for a girl to marry at that time, her parents began planning her marriage. However, she refused to marry due to her vow of virginity. And at the age of 16, she spent three years in prayerful solitude, preparing to enter into a lay Dominican sisterhood. After three years of strict seclusion, Catherine began her public life, which she believed was at the command of Jesus himself. When she was 19, as a third order Dominican, Catherine cared for the cancer victims and lepers in the local hospital. During the famine in 1370 and an outbreak of the plague in 1374, she tirelessly carried, cared for the sick and the poor Along with her followers, she worked night and day to care for those stricken with the plague. She prepared them for death and buried them with her own hands. Her words of comfort and encouragement brought them peace, and her prayers and sacrifices brought about their conversion. Catherine's love for others, evidenced by her many kindnesses for them, was driven by her deep love for the Eucharist, Catherine experienced an intense love for Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. She desired frequent communion so she could at least taste him, even if she could not yet fully satisfy the hunger in her heart to be united with him for all eternity. She told her spiritual director, I feel so satisfied both by the Lord whenever I receive his most adorable sacrament that I could not possibly feel any desire for any other kind of food. She had abundant amounts of energy to do all that God asked her to do and never seemed to be affected by lack of sleep or food. She was wholly nourished and energized by the consumption of the Eucharist, which she craved for spiritual nourishment. By 1370, Catherine gave up eating altogether and for the last 10 years of her life, she subsisted on the Eucharist as her only nourishment. On the fourth Sunday of Lent, 1375, Catherine received the stigmata, the five wounds of Christ. The stigmata was only visible to her and could not be seen by anyone else. But upon her death, it became visible to all. During the 14th century in Italy, women were not taught to read or write, but were trained only in homemaking skills. Catherine was no exception to the rule. Since she was illiterate, she used secretaries to dictate letters to men and women in every state of life. 
She not only corresponded with royalty, she even wrote letters to the Pope. Her obvious sanctity and wisdom attracted others, and soon she was surrounded by rich and poor alike, who were eager to seek her spiritual guidance and benefit from her great wisdom. Many desired to emulate her way of holiness. As the numbers grew, so did her influence. She gradually began to widen her horizons and play an active role in society. As time went on, the Lord revealed to Catherine that he wished to use her communication skills to impact the political life of her country. Seventy years had passed with seven popes living in Avignon, France, while the people of Rome had no pope. The Lord gave Catherine the mission of persuading Pope Gregory XI to return to Rome from France. This was a very difficult and distressing duty for her. But she was continually motivated by her passionate love for the church, as well as her deep respect for the Holy Father as the Vicar of Christ. She began corresponding with Pope Gregory XI and strongly urged him to return to Rome to reform the clergy, who are not living in accord with their consecrated calling. She even traveled to Avignon to meet with him and eventually assisted him in moving back to Rome. After Gregory was reestablished in the Eternal City in 1377, Catherine renewed her life of prayer and charity among her many followers for whom she was a constant inspiration. She spent most of that year executing a successful spiritual revival in the area. Early in 1378, she was sent by Pope Gregory XI to Florence to make peace between the warring factions in her country. When her task was established, she immediately returned to Siena, where she dictated the dialogue, the record of her revelations from the Lord. Catherine spent the rest of her life working tirelessly for the restoration of the church and serving the poor and suffering. Sensing that her life on earth was drawing to a close, she offered the sacrifice of her body in exchange for the unity and the renewal of the church. On April 21st, 1380, she suffered a paralytic stroke and died eight days later at the age of 33. Catherine was canonized by Pope Pius II in 1461, made patron of Italy in 1939 along with St. Francis of Assisi and was declared a doctor by, of the church by Pope Paul V, Pope Paul VI in 1970. Her writings rank among the classics of the Italian language. They consist of the dialogue, a collection of approximately 400 letters, and a series of prayers. We sometimes think of saints as cold, passionless, boring people. Catherine of Siena wasn't like that at all. When Father Bartholomew Dominic one of her future disciples first saw her as a young woman. He said that she looked very cheerful. And Raymond of Capua, her Dominican confessor and friend, said that she had an affectionate nature and an outgoing affability and a charming graciousness in her dealings with others. She also had a great sense of humor. Once, while on a journey, she was thrown off her donkey and was found laughing cheerfully. And when the donkey then fell on top of her, Catherine only smiled and told those with her, this little donkey is keeping me warm. People were naturally attracted to her. Although she was not educated in the formal sense of the word, many young people who were educated and who were from noble families in Siena 
enjoyed being with Catherine and would join her on her travels through Italy and the south of France. Sometimes her little community of followers consisted as many of as many as 60 people, usually more <coughs> men than women, including priests from the Dominican, Franciscan, and Augustinian orders. They called her Mama, and they were delighted to live in her company. The atmosphere among them was relaxed as seen in the fact that some of her disciples, after writing down the letters that she dictated to them, would playfully sign off with nicknames such as Crazy Giovanna or Foolish Kekka. Why is St. Catherine of Siena a doctor of the church? Well, we know that the classic cat criteria for becoming a doctor of the church was defined by Cardinal Lambertini, who was later to become Pope Benedict the 15th. In the beatification and the canonization of the servants of God, he includes the three following conditions for becoming a doctor of the church. The person must have eminent doctrine, outstanding holiness of life, and a declaration passed by the Supreme Pontiff or a legitimately assembled general council. St. Catherine evidences all three of this, these criteria. First, she possesses an eminent doctrine. In fact, one of the primary reasons Pope Paul VI conferred the doctor of the church on St. Catherine is her excellence of doctrine. Unlike many of the other doctors of the church, Catherine does not write great theological works or numerous volumes of text. Instead, her writings fit into about three books and consist of, first, her letters, which cover a period of about 10 years. Catherine writes these letters to people of every station in life, from popes, kings, and queens, to humble artists and members of her own family. A total of 381 letters still exist. Next is the dialogue. The dialogue is a conversation between Catherine and God the Father about the most important problems of mankind. These include the way of spiritual perfection, obedience, prayer, and divine providence as well as other matters of importance to the church and the society of her time. The dialogue is chiefly responsible for her title of Doctor of the Church. It's her crowning work, and it's highly regarded as one of the spiritual classics of all time. Pope Benedict XVI has referred to it as a masterpiece of spiritual literature Next come her 26 prayers, which cover approximately the last two years of her life. And as Catherine prayed aloud during these last months of her life, her disciples wrote down her prayers. The second criteria that she needs for doctor of the church is her outstanding holiness of life. As a canonized saint, St. Catherine demonstrated outstanding holiness and Pope Pius II's Bull of Canonization in 1461 confirmed that she did indeed live a life of outstanding holiness. Third, she received the declaration passed by the Supreme Pontiff. In 1970, Pope Paul VI declared St. Catherine a doctor of the church. Next, I'd like to share a little about St. Catherine's spirituality. Pope St. John Paul referred to Catherine's thought as a lived theology because it was not acquired from books, but from contact with divine love, in other words, from her union with God. Catherine's spiritual thought is very Christocentric meaning that Jesus is clearly at the center of everything. Yes, Catherine had great regard for Mary and the saints, but her gaze is always fixed on Christ. 
Her teaching stays very close to the gospel. There are many references to scripture in her writings, which reveal that Catherine had a profound grasp of the biblical message. And although she was a mystic, there was nothing aloof or detached about her. Throughout her writings, there is a determined emphasis on others, on one's neighbor. She says that the quality of our love of God is mirrored in the quality of our love of neighbor. If you want to really know how much you love God, then look at how much you really love your neighbor. And although she was the recipient of many mystical experiences, each of them represented a broadening and a deepening of her outreach, outreach to others instead of being private, isolated moments. In one of the most extraordinary letters in all of Christian literature, she tells her spiritual director how she accompanied a condemned man to the scaffold and moments later received his severed head in her hands. Yes, she was a great contemplative and lover of solitude who spent hours in prayer each day. As she came to love Jesus more and more, her love expands and is transformed into love of Christ's mystical body, the church. She firmly believed that the good of the church is the good of humanity and that anyone who rebelled against the church was his own enemy. As a Dominican, Catherine has a great respect for the truth, which is the motto of the order. The two most important truths that we need to know are the truth about God, who he is, and the truth about the human person, who we are and why we were created. Catherine believed that if we grow in holiness, we need to grow in a deeper knowledge of the truth. Growth in holiness means growing in the virtues, those divine and human attributes of Jesus Christ. The virtues are the beautiful traits that we should aspire to. In my new book, um, Seven Saints for Seven Virtues, I describe how St. Catherine of Siena is a model of the virtue of kindness. And I'd like to share a little bit about that with you this evening. What is the virtue of kindness? Kindness, or brotherly love for one's neighbor, is the virtue which counters the sin of envy. Envy, in contradiction to God's law of love, is manifest in a person's sorrow and distress over the good fortune of another person. <coughs> Conversely, <coughs> kindness and brotherly love is manifested is manifest in the unprejudiced, compassionate, and charitable concern for others. When we are kind to others, we're gentle, considerate, and helpful to those in need without expecting anything in return for our good deeds. When we are kind to others, we share our gifts with them, whether they be material, spiritual, or emotional. We help others without expecting compensation. The great philosopher Peter Kreeft defines kindness as sympathy with the desire to relieve another's suffering. Kindness is not only a virtue, but it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is in his modern Catholic dictionary, St. John, he's not a saint yet, Father John Harden, hopefully he will be soon, defines it as the quality of understanding sympathy and concern for those in trouble or need. It is shown in affability of speech generosity of conduct, and forgiveness of injuries sustained. In other words, when we show kindness to others, it is reflected in pleasant speech, generous behavior, and forgiveness of hurts. 
Why is St. Catherine of Siena a model of kindness? The source and basis for all that Catherine did was kindness out of love for others. She dedicated her life to care for both the corporal and spiritual needs of others. In one of her letters, Catherine wrote, Love does not stay idle. And this was a model, motto that she strictly adhered to in her concern and care for others. Catherine's compassion for the sick and the poor was limitless. In Siena, there was a poor woman named Tekka. Tekka was ill with leprosy and avoided everyone for obvious reasons. However, Catherine met the woman, embraced her, and offered to care for her as long as her services were needed. Catherine cooked for Tekka, fed her, and looked after her with much diligence and tender loving care. Amazingly, in spite of this, Tekka became hardened toward Catherine, becoming arrogantly demanding and verbally abusive, scolding her with angry words. Catherine returned her insults with calmness and loving care. Eventually, Catherine began to show signs of leprosy, particularly on her hands. And when Tekka passed on to the next life, Catherine prepared her body for the body for burial, washing it, clothing it, and laying it in the coffin. As soon as Tekka's body was buried, all trace of the leprosy on Catherine's hands disappeared, and they looked more beautiful and radiant than ever. Another member of the religious community in Siena, Andrea, had an open festering sore of her breast. It had eaten away her flesh and created a stench so foul that no one would go near the sick woman to help her, but Catherine sought Andrea out and began to look after her. She was with Andrea constantly, caring for her, cleaning and dressing her sore, showing no sign of repulsion, and always doing her best to be warm and cheerful. For some reason, Andrea began imagining that Catherine was committing all kinds of despicable deeds, and she spread this calm calumny. Catherine, however, continued to care for her with the same zeal, patience, and humility. Then one day, as she approached Andrea's bed, Catherine was surrounded by a beautiful light, and her face took on an angelic appearance. Andrea was astonished by the apparition and begged Catherine's pardon for all the scandalous stories she had spread. Catherine threw her arms round Andrea and comforted her as their tears intermingled. Andrea then recanted her lies and told others about the beautiful vision of Catherine that she had witnessed. Catherine was also a St. Nicholas figure to the poor. She anonymously delivered packages of food and clothing to them dropping them off at their doorstep without anyone noticing her. One morning, when she got out of bed, she noticed that her whole body was swollen. She remembered that today was the day she needed to deliver a package of food to a widow and her hungry family. How would she do this when she could barely move? She instantly fell to her knees and prayed, asking God to give her the strength and stamina to perform the task. Then she picked up the heavy, hefty package, and to her surprise, it was light as a feather. She quickly departed for the poor widow's home, but the nearer she got to the home, the heavier the load became. When she arrived at the family's home, the door was partially open, so she dropped the heavy package onto the floor of the living room. God wanted to show Catherine that despite the weight of the load, he would give her the strength to do his work. Like Catherine, despite our weaknesses, God can work through us in powerful ways. God wanted to convey to her the message that he can work through us as his simple instruments, his weak and broken vessels 
to bring his loving kindness to others. St. Paul confirms this in two scripture passages. The first is 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. And the second one is 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more grad gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For I am, when I am weak, then I am strong. When the plague struck Siena in 1374, Catherine compassionately and courageously cared for the victims, carrying a scent bottle to lessen the odors of the putrid environment and a lantern. She worked late into the night, allowing herself little sleep. She also encouraged many of her followers to join her in this charitable work. However, they were certainly not immune to the disease. And when one of Catherine's followers and friends, Matteo, the director of the city's hospital, was struck down with, by the plague, Catherine hurried to see him. Furious with the plague, she began shouting from a distance, Get up, Matteo, get up! This is not time for lying in a soft bed. At this command, Matteo's fever, swelling, and pain immediately disappeared. Afterward, Catherine quickly slipped away to avoid attracting attention to herself and receiving praise. In closing, I'd like to share an adapted excerpt from St. Catherine's Dialogue, followed by a prayer that she composed. If you choose me as your companion, you will not be alone. My love will always be with you. You will never fear anyone or anything, for you will find your security in me. With me as your companion, you will live in the light of faith with hope and fortitude with true patience and perseverance all the days of your life. I loved you before you existed, and knowing this, you can place your trust in my love and set aside every fear. Take from me the fire of my spirit and share it with all my mercy and my burning love. You are not alone. You have me. And here is her prayer entitled, My Nature is Fire. In your nature, eternal Godhead, I shall come to know my nature. And what is my nature, boundless love? It is fire because you are nothing but a fire of love, and you have given men, humankind, a share in this nature. For by the fire of love you created us, and so with all other people and every created thing, you made them out of love. O oh, grateful people, what nature has your God given you? his very own nature. Are you not ashamed to cut yourself off from such a noble thing through the guilt of deadly sin? O oh, eternal Trinity, my sweet love, you light, give us light. You wisdom, give us wisdom. 
you, supreme strength, strengthen us. Today, eternal God, let our cloud be dissipated so that we may perfectly know and follow your truth in truth with a free and simple heart. God, come to our assistance. Lord, make haste to help us. Amen.